let us hear God's word. The scripture today from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 14. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you, Jan. Happy Easter, my friends. It is good to see all of you here on this bright and beautiful Easter morning. Uh, my name is Jason Mankey. I'm one of the pastors here at People's Church. And I want to draw your attention in your programs. There's a green slip of paper. And on that green slip of paper, these are what we call our growth sheets. And um, there are some questions that you can take a look at after service um, if you want to continue to have the discussion um, and, and think about our message. There are also um, prayers on uh, one side uh, for the morning and the evening. They change every week. If you'd like to have some prayers, you can pray at home. So, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we had all sorts of traditions to make Christmas, yeah, Christmas, a very special morning. Joe and I have continued those traditions for our kids. I mean, we decorated the house top to bottom. Cookies and milk are left for Santa. 
the kids and creep into the living room to see their stockings and presents. And fortunately, as they get older, that starts to get later and later. Um, but Christmas, Christmas is special. But what about Easter? I mean, it doesn't seem so special. There was a time when Easter was the high point of the church year. First, there were 40 days of preparation and expectation that was called Lent. 40 days of long preparation and, uh, for the great feast of Easter. Then Easter, once it came, you know how long it lasted? 50 days. The great 50 days of Easter, the church called it. Now in most churches, Christmas uh, takes most of our time and preparation and draws a lot more excitement than Easter. Looking back in our family, there were ways we tried to make Easter somewhat special. Of course, we had uh, Easter eggs and Easter baskets. Um, the kids often got some uh, candy from the Easter bunny and we got them a little gift. But nothing really compared to the pomp and circumstance of Christmas, even though it celebrated the great day of our Lord's resurrection. Now, kids, kids, did you know we get our custom for, of dying and eating Easter eggs from the really ancient Christians who saw the egg as a kind of symbol of immortality? And there is evidence that early Christians met on Easter at the tombs of their deceased, uh, of deceased Christians, so at their graveside, and ate their Easter meal there. In fact, during the excavations of what is believed to be St. Peter's tomb um, last century, they found what they thought was a pile of eggshells. Um, leading archaeologists to believe that that special meal was celebrated there. So what do you think of that as your new uh, Easter tradition, folks? You go and have dinner at the graveside of your faithful family members. I can kind of see why it hasn't caught on and stayed a tradition. Today we hear, uh, heard read for us by Jan, the story of the first Easter according to the Gospel of John. Now we're very familiar uh, uh, of the stories told by Mark, Luke, and Matthew, but not so much by John. Most of us know by heart the story of the women running to the tomb and, and finding it empty early on Easter morning, and then running back to tell the disciples. There's also the story of the disciples locked uh, behind doors and Jesus appearing to them on Easter evening. Then there's Luke's great story of the risen Christ appearing to a couple of disciples who are on a long walk to a town called Emmaus. Today, we hear about the risen Jesus appearing then after the resurrection, to the disciples at breakfast. When we worship here at church, we have a special meal ourselves. We have the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion, which we will be celebrating in a little bit. And we believe it's in that meal, when we eat the bread and wine, the risen Christ is really present to us. This is a very special meal, a holy meal that we eat in the church. But Jesus' meal with the disciples in the, the reading today, it doesn't seem very special. I mean, it's just breakfast. Out of all of the meals that we eat on any given day, breakfast is the most ordinary, isn't it? Most of us eat the same thing for breakfast each and every morning. If we stagger down to breakfast and find the box of cornflakes empty, well, then the rest of our day just isn't right, is it? 
Few of our meals are more ritualized, more predictable, more humdrum than breakfast. Breakfast is not a meal where we look for creativity. Rather, we look for something that is routine, something to help us get us up and going in the morning. And on that morning, Jesus, the risen Christ, meets with seven of his disciples on a beach in Galilee two weeks after Easter. The risen Christ has met with his disciples on two successive Sundays. But on that morning, they're back at work in Galilee. Can, can, can you believe it? After encountering the risen Christ, they went back home and went back to work. Now let me, let, let, let me ask you seriously. If you had come face to face with a, pers a person resurrected from the dead on two occasions no less, would you be able to go home and go back to work like nothing at all had happened? Now on the occasion the risen Christ had appeared, uh, on the one occasion when the risen Christ had appeared to them, he gave them instructions. He told them what they needed to do next. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I have sent you. In other words, just as I have loved you and taught you how to love, go out and love others. Well, what in the world happened to that command? Rather than go out into the world and make disciples and teach people how to love, they're back home in backwater Galilee, catching fish? Do you think uh, this was the way you would have handled Easter? I mean, I could understand handling Good Friday in that way. After all, who would really be surprised that Jesus was crucified? This is the world, way the world treats its prophets and saviors, by killing them. The disciples, while in great grief over the death of Jesus, were quite willing to go back home and go back to the work of, uh, after the crucifixion. But really, after a resurrection? How could they go back to Galilee and go fishing after encountering the risen Christ? One theologian and fantastic preacher um, has noted that it's easier to deal with a crucifixion than it is a resurrection. Most of us think the uh, of the resurrection as something that happens to us after we die. When we're taken up into this other world out there somewhere. Well, the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen in some distant future. It didn't occur in some other world. It was here. It was now. When the risen Christ encountered his disciples, they were not up in heaven. They were, uh, they were out in Galilee. They weren't strumming harps of gold. They were pulling in their nets. So maybe the trouble the disciples had with the resurrection wasn't simply that someone had been brought back from the dead. The problem was that the resurrection had moved from the future tense somewhere out there to the present tense. Here was Jesus, here, now. If we read between the lines, we can feel the shock the disciples felt. The gospel accounts of the appearance of the risen Christ seem at times to conflict with one another, to describe him almost like a ghost, and then moving through locked doors, but still being able to touch, sitting down with them at a table, being able to eat and drink with them. Oh, please be patient with the gospel's accounts of Easter. They obviously were trying to describe something that was almost indescribable. Their conventional modes of thought and expression just didn't seem to work. Their difficulty was not that they were having uh, trouble believing that the resurrection might occur somewhere someday out there. It's fairly easy to describe in certain vague, 
ethereal, poetic categories, something that nobody has ever experienced in the here and now, something that is safely projected into the distant future in clouds somewhere out there. The trouble with the resurrection of Jesus was that it was right here, right now. Eugene Peterson, once again, says he thinks that is why we find the disciples back in Galilee fishing. He writes, and I quote, They need to reinforce their grip on everyday reality. The country they grew up in. The work they feel at home in. The sea and fishing boat. Their fishing nets. They had experienced a great shock, after all. I mean, you know how it is when you've experienced some trauma, some great shock in your life. Helpful friends urge you to get back to work as soon as possible. Immerse yourself in those everyday, mundane, habitual tasks, the routine and the predictable, and that's what the disciples seem to be doing. But they weren't trying to get over the trauma of death. They were trying to deal with the trauma of life, eternal life, resurrection among them, Jesus standing before them. And we hear that the disciples fished all night and they had caught nothing, nothing. They're back to their old predictable routine of failure. They are uh, failures at being disciples. They didn't obey Jesus when he told them to go out and make other disciples. And they're also failures at fishing. They have caught nothing. You wonder how, before they met Jesus, they ever made a living at that thing. And they don't like failure. But just as we deal with the cross, find the cross perfectly understandable because that's just the way that the world works. It's also possible to deal with failure because this is the way that the world works. You try, you struggle, but death has the last word. Empty nets, empty lines. This may not be a very pretty picture, but at least it's a picture that we can understand. This is the real world. These are the facts of life. And as the sun rises, they are surprised to look out and see Jesus on the beach. They're a long way from Jesus, about 100 yards, and they do not seem to recognize him. He calls them, asking them how their fishing is going. Then he directs them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. They do so, and their nets fill with fish. They pull in the nets, now bursting with fish. John is the first to see and to cry out, It is the Lord! And the Gospel writer says that Peter dives into the water and swims to shore to embrace Jesus, to be embraced by Jesus. And Jesus has prepared a meal, a fire, and has made breakfast for them on the beach. And he invites them to eat. Once again, Jesus fills their hungry souls because they have eaten from the work of his hand before. Surely this helps them recognize him. And you know that scene on the beach around eating breakfast, it's, it's so ordinary. Them sitting in a circle just eating breakfast. And yet this is his peculiar glory. It isn't simply that Jesus is raised from the dead. It's that he appears to us here and now. He feeds us. There in ordinary Galilee, during an ordinary workday, he shares an ordinary meal with his disciples. And this is where we meet the risen Christ, or more to the point of the story where he meets us. I mean, I, I, I know, I know there's something to be said about getting away from it all, 
slipping away into some quiet place to pray, sitting alone on some mountaintop where the sun rises and the sky seems golden, and there we say God is here. But there is also something to be said, according to this story, for doing what you do every day for being where you usually are, for simply opening your eyes at breakfast. And it's there the risen Christ is with us, where we have that encounter. It's there that Easter becomes ordinary, and it is its most glorious. There have been many times in my uh, ministry. I've tried to move a congregation to having communion more often. I've never won that discussion. I've tried to have it weekly. If we have it more often, won't it be less special? There was always someone there to ask. But in my experience, I've found that churches that have the Lord's Supper more frequently seem to value it more. The glory of this meal is that it's not supposed to be special. This is the ordinary food of Christians. The presence of the risen Christ among us, as today's gospel reminds us, isn't special, but it's so wonderfully ordinary. He comes to us where we are here and now in the bread and the wine at our work when we're in play in prayer in song in handshakes and embraces thank goodness we don't have to wait for some distant eternity to be close to the risen christ he comes out to galilee where we live maybe that's why for most of us the most important holy, sacred time we have with our families is around the dinner table together. It isn't that the food is special. It isn't that the words we say over the food make it holy. Rather, it's the presence of family that makes this ordinary gathering so extraordinary. Every meal... Every meal, once a blessing is said, becomes a kind of sacrament, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, as some of our rituals put it. You know, interesting thing, the story of the Easter breakfast on the beach doesn't record any great ethical instructions by Jesus. I can't find anything in that story that you're supposed to go and do tomorrow. Rather, I think this story is told to us as a kind of gracious promise. And here there is a promise that we will go back to Galilee, resume whatever it was we were doing before we came to this place, take up our work, uh, take up our everyday workaday duties, and that is where he promises to meet us. He comes to us. He calls us. He feeds us, gathers us, strengthens us, is deeply, undeniably present to us. And in doing so, he redeems all of our lives. Not just on Easter Sunday, but on Easter Monday and all of the little Easter's moving forward. In some ways, Easter is so wonderfully, gloriously ordinary. Shall we pray together? And as Pastor Kate mentioned, we're going to open up with our breakthrough prayer. I invite you to pray along with me. God of love and power, Fill us with your grace and mercy. Open doors, bring down walls. Lead us into a new season of faithfulness and fruitfulness as we discern our next step 
and give us the courage to follow. Wonderful and gracious God, we come here and we are met with, met with the empty tomb. We are here and we can't believe our eyes, our hearts, our spirits, because our world has just been turned upside down on its head. What is expected no longer rules the day. Lord, sometimes in our lives, we're more comfortable with death, with failure, with disappointment, because that's the way that the world has always worked. Conflicts between people, anger, division. And yet, Lord, this day turns all of those expectations on our head, and we're left reeling as you witness to us that life defeats death, that love defeats hate, that unity is brought forth through love and grace, not anger and frustration. And Lord, it's not just here that we experience it, but we experience little Easter's when a relationship is restored that was once broken. When we feel connected and loved by someone at a time of our greatest need. When we feel lost and don't know where to, to turn and we're surrounded by a community of love and support. Lord, we thank you for all of the ways that we experience your Easter promise. All of the ways that you come to us, Lord. Our hearts, our souls, our minds are open to your presence here with us this morning. We expect to be encountered by you here. Help us to leave this place and expect to be encountered with you on the roads in which we, uh, on the sidewalks in which we walk, in our homes in which we live, in the places where we work. Help us keep our eyes, hearts, and minds open to your Spirit's touch and your movement in our lives. And Lord, we say to you, here we are. Send us. Send us with deeds and words of love and grace to care and love in a hurting world where people are struggling, where they don't need know where to turn, where they feel hopeless, um, even though on the outside everything looks perfect and ideal. Lord, help us to pay attention to the mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of people and help us when we have an opportunity to simply be with them, to be your loving hands in their lives, like just as you send people to us to love us when we are struggling. We lift up to you now all of those prayers of joy and concern on the silence of our hearts and minds. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.